Hello friends and welcome to Deeply Rooted. Here is a place where we can come together. Having made the decision that we will live our lives more fully. Understanding that we are spiritual first and foremost. Self-awareness really is a superpower. And we want to live more deeply into the experiences that we have as human beings. I'm so glad you're here. There's something about the order of things. Audrey Hepburn said this. Pick the day. Enjoy it to the hilt, the day as it comes, people as they come. The past, I think, has helped me appreciate the present, and I don't want to spoil any of it by fretting about the future. Think about this for a day. Pick a day to take on this type of assignment perhaps even today. Operation Joy. No matter how much you think this might not open your capacity to see more joy in your life, try it. Either on your own or team up with a friend or two. And then open your heart, open your eyes to see more joy smiles, kindnesses, beauty in nature, the sound of your shoes on the leaves, birds singing, a job well done. Compare notes and then commit to doing this on a regular basis. So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome back to our segment of Diary of a Montessori Teacher and Creative Entrepreneur. January 16th. Very creative day. I finished all my assignments for the creative business planning course I signed up for, created three new dolls and photographed, and felt super connected to each one. Inspired by Luna, our beautiful rabbit who feels like a friend and protector, by Beatrice Potter and Nuffle Bunny. Something about listening to creatives who are just starting out reminds me of what it felt like in the beginning 14 years ago. How it started as a way to make me feel less anxious when my husband was deployed and I was home with a two-year-old and no family support. And then when we moved to Europe and then two moves to Colorado and one move to Virginia right when my business had just started off. Creativity has been purposeful in helping me track my life. January 17th. Three-day weekends are the best. 
I prepped eight dolls in assembly line fashion since I never know when the, what the week will bring. I ironed all the cloth for the dolls and the sewing kits. Finally caught up with Marco Polo while grocery shopping. Then went through all of my deep space sparkle cl curriculum to create a list of art lessons for preschool students. I gathered all the lesson ideas from the outdoor activity books I got from the library and created a photo diary of a hundred lessons to choose from that should create a vibrant classroom experience. I also have a djembe and a trampoline that I will take to school from time to time. And I located a timer to use for these activities because I know they will be popular. January 18th. Created two more dolls in the Valentine line. The goal is to create 12 in this run of fabrics. Hand stamp the words for the sewing kits. Took a little time since we were not working, schooling, to go to the thrift store and the dollar store for supplies and to buy a planner. Reorganized the closet as I listened to my business group's replay from yesterday. I have a loose idea for the week. Piet Mondrian, reintroduce a scavenger hunt, this time with a basket of clues to find. Thinking up an idea with cardboard and tiny boxes, but for now, just in the collecting stage. I randomly looked over at my bookcase and found the process art book that I knew I had purchased. And got back to recording my podcast, including this work and art journaling and a writing prompt for the day. I also finally started asking for financial support for the free work that I do. January 19th. Students back in school after a three-day weekend. Well, as a teacher, you want the three days, but then you remember the mental workout you get the first day back. I actually found poop pallets on the gray community rug where we do circle time. And it rained, which means everything outside needed to be dried. And then there's the puddles. And all the students that have been home sick are back at school, which meant 23 nappers in one room. You can't even imagine the shenanigans. The art project on Mondrian went well. Today's artist is Kandinsky and Circles. And I have a Chinese New Year project that I want to try. I completed the descriptions of the six dolls created for Valentine's Day. And I hand dyed the papers for February's art journal kit. No practice for Hunchback yesterday, so Josie had a lesson with her voice coach. And we contacted a realtor about buying a house. Well, I'm bringing back a very popular segment that I've had over the last year or so on the podcast called Love Poems from God, 12 Sacred Voices from the East and the West by uh, a gentleman named Daniel Ladinsky. And basically it uh, takes the mystics, 12 mystics from the East and the West, so some you may already know and some who may be new to you, and um, it offers these poems um, that are just, have been quite inspiring for me to hear and um, from the um, replays that I see on my podcast um, for you as well. So I hope you enjoy them. So what I usually do is I start with a little history lesson background uh, biography on each one of the mystics and then we go into a poem. So today I want to introduce you to Kabir. The fish in the water that is thirsty needs serious professional counseling. For 500 years, the poems of Kabir have been recited and sung throughout India. Kabir was a great religious reformer in his time, as well as a famous artist and musician, founding a sect that still claims to have a million followers. Kabir achieved a remarkable synthesis of Hindu, Muslim, and even Christian belief. Um, 
Rabindranath Tagore, the famous Bengali poet and novelist who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913, was a major force in bringing the wonderful poems of Kabir to the attention of the West when he published some translations of Kabir in 1915. Some present-day readers of Kabir liken him to something of a tough guy, a Zen bruiser, a divine smart aleck, but there are many dimensions of this great master that one can bring to light, including his rarely revealed tenderness and his delicious freeing humor. As all of Kabir's poems were probably originally songs, one of the many legends surrounding his life may be true. He chose not to read or, or write, as this rendering also leads one to think. Paper would turn to flame if I touched it in an ec ecstatic mood, and ink dries if it comes a hundred feet within the radiance of one who will not let God leave their arms. Why trouble a pen in, to labor? I've got naked angels camping on my floors with nothing more to do than imprint my words upon the sky when I sing them. Having mentioned the fate of paper when I am in love, and I am always in love, how could a son like me ever appear dressed? Sounds like an interesting mystery that can help the board pass some time. Kabir was born in Varanasi in North India into a family of weavers who had recently converted to Islam, though it is widely believed that he was a disciple of a famous Hindu guru, uh, Ramanandu, Ramananda. While a family man and a weaver, Kabir passionately sought to show the way out of delusion, including the delusion of religious identity. During his lifetime, both mainstream and Hindus Hindus and Muslims denounced him, only coming to claim and revere him as their own after his death. Kabir was well aware of the misunderstanding of the public toward a true mystic. This is reflected in the unique irony that pervades his poetry. Even so, there can be discovered a remarkable compassion and tenderness in his verse, as portrayed in No Harm Done. Kabir's life both exemplifies and parallels all the saints in this book, as well as any living master. That is, saints will usually create or allow controversy about themselves that then serves as a kind of watchdog to keep the world at an arm's distance. The people who can get close to such a saint have to go through an ego-dying process. It is a paradoxical spiritual truth. The closer a teacher is to God, the harder they, they are to have faith in and to live around, while the less advanced the teacher is, the more they can be easily accepted by the average person. Kabir, even when he had many wealthy followers, chose to live in a very small rundown house in a rough section of town where people were afraid to venture at night. It was the same area where the butchers had their shops, where the dying shrieks of animals confronted all ears, and where the stench of slaughtered animals could become unbearable in the summer months. The circumstances Kabir lived in were usually challenging to some of his Hindu disciples, who were strict vegetarians. Where he chose to live would probably have kept many of his present-day readers so at odds with their spiritual standards. They would not even visit Kabir if he were alive today. My point being that what we see of historical saints is often tremendously edited as a way the way a parent might edit what their child hears and sees. Christianity as a whole at times strikes me as a remark remarkably edited view of God, as do the beliefs of any religion that promotes any kind of division between the soul and the creation. But how wonderful such views exist to help the spiritually young grow. The problem, though, becomes we begin to want God on our terms, not his. And our conditional terms will probably always keep us separate from the one we say we love and the one we need to unite with. What an irony. With so much religious propaganda playing havoc with us, when I felt it was legitimate, I tried to fill in some of the blanks. Unedit lights freedom 
and not weaken the sweet divine punches by this playful witty one. Again, the words of Kabir. The fish in the water that is thirsty needs serious professional counseling. The glorious role of the mystical poets is to help us accept God more as he is and ever less than our prejudices and fears want him to be. May Kabir's poems help us reduce the income of psychiatrists and maybe even undermine a military budget or two. Why not dream big? Here's a poem for you. It's called I Just Laugh. If I told you the truth about God, you might think I was an idiot. If I lied to you about the beautiful one, you might parade me through the streets shouting, this guy is a genius. This world has its pants on backwards. Most carry their, vol their values and knowledge in a jug that has a big hole in it. Thus, having a clear grasp of the situation, if I am asked anything these days, I just laugh.